Of all the subjects in psychology, there's probably nothing more important than the study of social and emotional development. How do we raise children to become healthy, resilient human beings? Uh, you are going to be reading in this week's chapter about research that focuses on the interplay between infants and their caregivers that can provide the foundations for healthy emotional and social growth. Research into this area has a rich and illustrious history and I encourage you to find the time to read more uh, and even more of the historical kinds of uh, uh, texts in this area. Some of the research that you'll be looking at, for example, uh, the work on attachment goes back uh, initially to the 1930s and 1940s in classic psychologists such as uh, John Bowlby, the British uh, psychologist who wrote books such as Attachment and Loss. Uh, even the, the research on temperament uh, by Thomas Chesson Birch goes back some 40 to 50 years. And the foundations for these uh, research interests are in theoretical work about personality theories, uh, including, um, you know what, I think I want to start over, because yeah. I'm, just, I'm just sort of uh and in Owen. Okay. Um, of all the areas in psychology, the study of social and emotional development is probably the most important and the one that concerns us in our everyday lives the most. How do we raise healthy, resilient children who can go out into the world and form uh, meaningful and rich relationships? In developmental psychology, there's a rich history of theory and research behind what you're going to be reading about this week. Going all the way back to the turn of the last century and the works of Freud, for example, that really brought to prominence the importance of parent-child relationships. And of course, more recently, uh, and of more significance to us, the work of Eric Erickson, who put into everyday kinds of language uh, ways of understanding what children need and how they can be provided with the tools to allow them to grow into healthy and um, relational people. Some of the research that you'll be reading about in your text uh, has a rich history as well. Uh, the work on temperament, for example, uh, includes classic research of the 1950s and 60s by Thomas Chesson Birch, as well as more recent efforts to look at this subject. And the central topic, uh, that of attachment, that is how infants and caregivers form warm emotional bonds with each other, goes back to work uh, in the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, psychologists such as uh, John Bowlby, the famous British psychologist who wrote wonderful classic texts on attachment and loss, for instance. Or um, uh, Mary Ainsworth, who I remember uh, as an undergraduate uh, reading uh, research she was doing at that time at uh, Penn State on secure attachment and insecure attachment. So what you're reading in this chapter has a great deal of history behind it. And if you wanted to read more of the primary sources, uh, some of you would find that very interesting. Now, in some sense, I think we worry too much about whether we're doing the wrong thing or whether we'll make mistakes, uh, whether children can recover from uh, early deprivations and the like. And so uh, let me first of all say that children are very resilient for the most part, that they are not neutral in terms of seeking uh, attachment. Uh, they come into the attachment relationship with certain built-in and inherited characteristics, physical, sensory, uh, cognitive. Uh, for instance, uh, they uh, are born with large eyes. And though their vision is poor, uh, it is such that when they're being held in our arms and we're looking at them, they see our faces clearly and uh, we see their eyes looking at us. Uh, psychologists have names for everything and they call that mutual gaze. In the last 20 years, psychologists have become more and more inter 
interested in what's called interactional synchrony. That is, the complex and subtle ways in which infants and caregivers uh, relate to each other and give each other support and feedback uh, as they develop emotional relationships. Well, again, for most of us as parents, we don't need to be taught how to form an emotional relationship with our children. We intended to have children. We think they're the greatest thing. And even if we need to develop some competence in knowing how to respond to them and what they need, uh, most of us gain that fairly quickly uh, along with confidence in ourselves as we hold our children, as we touch them, as we uh, uh, meet their needs in an ongoing way. I thought I would talk for a little bit this morning about this interactional synchrony uh, and some of the features of it that you'll be reading about. First of all, as I said, infants come into the world with certain kinds of tendencies to draw us to them and to be attracted to us in the world. Uh, Harry Harlow, another famous psychologist of the 1950s and 60s and 70s, uh, showed in his research that infants really seek out uh, contact comfort. They are soothed by gentle rubbing. They are calmed by close holding. They quickly develop emotions. Uh, social smiles as early as two months, for example, or laughter by four months that engages us so that we know when we please them and we increase our efforts to do so over time. Uh, infants are also, though born with a variety of temperaments, tend to have temperamental styles that are good for us as caregivers as well. Uh, they are easy babies, for instance. They are fairly rhythmic, so we know what their day-to-day -day life needs are. They are fairly adaptable, so they are able to adjust to changes uh, uh, in their environments. And even infants who may be uh, less easy, who may be more irritable or more cautious, uh, slow to warm up infants or difficult infants, uh, to use Thomas Chess and Birch's phrase, are by no means as a result of that relegated to being insecure. Secure attachment is the result of a sense of confidence in the bonds that develop between caregiver and infant. Uh, Erickson calls this a uh, trust versus mistrust. And the foundation of trust, Erickson would tell us, is the ability of caregivers to respond to their infant's needs in ways that are essentially uh, consistent, uh, systematically sensitive, that is, uh, they read their babies well, and appropriate. Now luckily you don't have to have gone to college or take courses to respond to the emotional expressions of young children. Uh, without knowing it almost, we come to recognize quickly, for instance, that infants have several different kinds of cries. They cry differently when they're hungry, a kind of low and softly emerging cry than they do when they are upset, a kind of loud and more intense and sudden cry. We also don't need to practice or study in some formal way how to respond to infants. Most of us figure out what works. If we hold our baby and rubbing their back calms them down, we do that again. If we rock them gently and that helps, we do that again as well. So very quickly for most of us, we do respond with sufficient sensitivity and in appropriate ways that give a feedback to our infants that the world is safe and responsive to me. Now Erickson in talking about this kind of interactional synchrony says that the result of the infant's expression of need being met in appropriate ways is that they come to make certain emotional assumptions about the world. First of all, for example, they come to assume that their expression of need is legitimate. And that's something I hope all of you share as well. If you want something, you can work for it. If you are upset about something, you can express it. The idea that what we're feeling and what we need is legitimate is at the heart of confidence in us throughout our lives. Uh, secondly, uh, Erickson suggests that um, infants come to assume that if they express needs, those needs will be responded to. So that this develops in a child 
a sense, not only are my needs legitimate, but that I can trust that someone is out there paying attention to me and providing me with what we need. Now again, uh, this is not left to chance for the most part. For example, uh, breastfeeding women know that uh, they begin to feel the urge and the pressure to breastfeed in synchrony to their young infant's hunger. So these things can go hand in hand. Sensitive parents recognize, uh, oh, when my baby wakes up, uh, he needs to be fed right away, or he likes to be changed, or this is something that he'll find pleasing. And parents uh, who are sensitive tend to set up their environments and uh, be proactive in how they interact with their children. What Erickson suggests in each of the stages that we'll talk about uh, is that children develop certain emotional confidences as a result of positively resolving the emotional needs of a given stage. And for infants in the stage of trust versus mistrust, the foundational uh, irrational assumption that children gain is a sense of hope. Uh, that's a pretty important thing to gain and that's why Erickson states that trust versus mistrust uh, is the first of uh, the eight stages that he describes. Just a word on toddlers by the way, uh, you know, uh, uh, as infants develop a sense of confidence that their needs will be met, they in fact become what uh, Mary Ainsworth and her colleagues would call securely attached. And the result of secure attachment is that as toddlers, interestingly, uh, young children feel more comfortable exploring their environments and moving away from their parents uh, to do so. Uh, toddlers who lack some confidence may still remain more dependent, insisting on being in a parent's lap, uh, not wanting to let go of their leg, uh, limited in their ability to explore around them. But most children uh, are able to do that adequately. Now even in a securely attached child, you'll notice that if uh, you were as a stranger to walk into a room with a two and a half year old, she would probably go back to her mother. You know, she'd touch home base. But you'd also notice that within about 10 or 15 minutes, that same child might be exchanging toys with you. So secure attachment and a sense of trust in infancy leads to the ability to begin to separate emotionally and socially and explore environments as toddlers. Uh, Erickson calls this autonomy versus shame and doubt and says the hallmark of autonomy is a sense of will. That is a sense that I'm a separate person who can be the agent of, of action in my life. I can feed myself, I can dress myself, I can do things on my own. And this sense of the self as a distinct uh, agent that one is in control of is also very associated with health, not just for toddlers, but even in adulthood. Well, you'll be reading in this unit, as I say, about some of the classic topics associated with social and emotional growth. Uh, temperament, which children are born with and bring into the world, attachment, which is formed by the interaction and relationship between infants and their caregivers. You'll read as well about some of the problems can, that can arise, about insecure attachment, for instance, or about avoidant attachment. But for the most part, you'll read and learn, I hope, that the skills needed to provide children with what they need to be healthy emotionally healthy individuals are not that difficult for us to provide and that children for the most part are very responsive uh, to those efforts on our part. So uh, enjoy your reading and uh, I will look for you uh, in our discussion groups.